built. So we'll try to work on the sound and see what sounds like. But I'll go ahead. All right, so this is Catherine. I'll give her a warm welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It's kind of just see there. McEnroe part two, if you hear last one, you saw Tom, who is my husband of 35 years. And, um, and uh, as you can see, we have a little bit different style and way of doing things, but we are a real team in most other ways. Um, just want to tell you right up front, I'm going to start with an illustration. It happens to be my own illustration. But some of my illustrations I've lifted from books or other speakers. I feel like illustrations are sort of like jokes. Once they've gotten the public domain, you don't have to give anybody credit for them, right? But, um, but I will let you know that part of my talk tonight is, is influenced by some of the reading I've been doing, um, specifically some books by David Platt called Radical and Follow Me, as well as some books by um, John Piper. So if you wonder who's influencing me, those are two in the last couple months that I am drawing from as well as a study I've been doing all of last year in First and Second Corinthians. Um, so about five weeks ago, I was sitting in the living room watching TV. It must have been about 6 o'clock, and there was a knock on the door. And we weren't expecting anybody, so I pretty much assumed it was going to be some type of last-minute sales call before, you know, dusk took over. And sure enough, there was a, a woman standing there. She introduced herself as a professional fundraiser for one of those children's organizations where you sponsor a child per month and it feeds them and helps provide clothes. And she did her spiel. Um, they were a five-star rated organization. Most of the money actually went to um, the children themselves and not the organization's you know, administrative costs, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so she, she gave me it all and, and then she's looking for me to say I'd like to do it. And I said, you know, I, I've heard of your organization and I know that it does a good work, but I said, I'm at the point in my life that any giving I do apart from my church, I specifically do through Christian organizations. I said, if I'm gonna feed a child, I want them to be fed in Jesus' name. If I'm gonna clothe a child, I just want them to be clothed in Jesus' name. I, I want Jesus to get the credit. And she looked a little surprised by that and she said, but what does it matter? We're all children of God. And I had that phenomenon, which I'm sure you've done, where I think of multiple conversations in my mind, all in a millisecond, right? I only had a second to answer, but I'm thinking I could answer this way, I could answer this way. And I just briefly said, you know, actually, we are not all children of God. Again, she sort of got taken by surprise. And, and I guess she probably figured this wasn't going anywhere because she did say, but God loves everyone. And I said, yes, God loves everyone. <laughs> and, and we said goodbye. So starting with that, we are not actually all children of God automatically. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are, okay? And, and I want to just give you a, a background of what we were before we were children of God because the Bible is very clear that we were actually his enemies. He said we were his enemies. He says in our sin that we were alienated from him and hostile toward him. The Bible says that everyone loves darkness and hates the light in their pre-Christian state. It says we live in impurity and wickedness, that our minds are depraved, that we are blinded by the truth, by the God of this world. And there's that famous Romans verse, there is no one righteous, none at all, no one who understands, no one who seeks God. And I just wanted to press on this point that we were such enemies of God that he had to actually satisfy his own righteous anger by sending his son to die on our behalf. It cost him his son to rescue us from sin, from hell, and from death. And, and what's so beautiful, though, about this passage is that God went beyond this rescuing love, 
beyond the love of sacrifice, beyond the love of forgiveness, he went all the way deep into a kind of love. It says that he made us a part of his own family. He adopted us as children of God. And if you're not going to take this for granted, you have to start from that truth and that premise that you were his enemy to begin with. And that's what makes this beautiful truth of being adopted into his family so extraordinary. Because God didn't have to do it. God could have said, these are my enemies. They're not worth my son. I wouldn't even sacrifice my son for angels. Why should I sacrifice him for sinful, rebellious humans? Or he could have said, you know what? I, I will send my son. I will redeem them. But I'm not going to get involved with them on a personal level. I, I'll just set them up for eternity on some planet. I'll just communicate with angels. But I'm going to be stepping away. But no, he doesn't. He gets deep. He gets involved. He goes all the way in to make us a member of his family. But even adoption in the way that we normally think of it isn't an adequate description. And I know you've had Dr. Ekman here. Have, has anybody heard the document, Dr. Ekman thing about adoption? That right off the bat, you know? Okay. Well, I, I had a class from Dr. Ekman at Western Seminary about 15 years ago. So if he ever sees this and wants to correct me um, when he's here, he can do so. But, but this is the way I recall Dr. Ekman talking about adoption, basically from Paul the Apostle point of view. In the Roman world, in the ancient Roman world, people didn't do infant adoption. You didn't have to do a lot of paperwork. And the reason was you could go to any dump outside the city and find any number of abandoned babies just thrown in the refuge, usually by the poor. And you could take one without any hassle and take them home and raise them. But people didn't do that. What an elderly couple would do, or a couple that was getting older, usually someone who had had a business, had been successful, accumulated assets, wealth, would do if they were childless, is they would wait. And what they would do is they would find a young, usually adult male, one who already showed promise, a responsible young man, an intelligent young man, a hardworking young man, and they would adopt this one, because he would be a sure thing. They knew he was going to work out. And, and the point, Dr. Ekman says, is adoption was for the purpose of bringing the son into the family business. And, and that's us. We are adopted by Christ, right, by the Father, too, to come into the family business, which is reconciliation, bringing people to the Lord, getting to, to know God. And that's sort of the Pauline view of adoption. It's the idea of being brought into the family business. But John, the writer of 1 John, is a little bit different. He's taken a little bit of different approach to adoption. And, and, and he's taken a little bit of a different approach to the kind of love he wants us to realize. So when he's talking about adoption, it's not about this adult child bringing into the family business. He's thinking of something more profound and he's thinking of something more in line with a new birth. Now, my husband Tom is adopted. Okay? He was brought into the McEnroe family when he was four months old. And um, obviously, they couldn't ta cause Tom to be born again. They took him in as this, this young infant. And they could take him. They could love him. They could attempt to influence him with their love and in all other ways. But basically, they were getting a child that had the genetic markers, disposition that came from his biological parents, right? Those are sort of predetermined. They, they come. You take what you get. Um, so they influenced with love, but they could not get into his very nature and change him. But God does. And that's the kind of love that John is getting at here in chapter 3. He's talking about a love that doesn't just take care of paperwork and adopt. And that would be amazing beyond words if that was all that God did. But, but John sees more. He's saying the Father actually moves in, 
by his spirit. Later on in the chapter, it says, by his seed. And he imparts something of himself by his spirit so we actually take on a family resemblance. That's the kind of adoption and love that he's talking about. So what does this family resemblance look like? I've, I've titled tonight's talk, um, what, did I, what did I talk it? A transformed life, right? I think a transformed life, right. And, and so later, if you keep reading chapter um, three, I think it's in verse um, six, or verse three, John says, everyone who has this hope, this new birth, in him purifies himself just as he, Jesus, is pure. So one of the things that a transformed life looks like is that it looks like a pure life. And the other thing is in, in verse 6, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Um, and, and basically, John is saying sin actually matters. And here's a wonderful illustration I lifted from somebody, and, and I just love it. And it talks about why sin matters. So it, it took place, as a true story, it took place in a Muslim country. I don't know which one. Um, they didn't want to give that away. But uh, a, a, a Muslim, former Muslim turned Christian was talking to a taxi driver, witnessing to him. And he said, what would happen if right now I just reached out and I slapped you in the face. The taxi driver said, well, I'd probably pull over and say, get out of my taxi, okay? And he said, well, what would happen if I just randomly went up to that little crowd of men over there and slapped one of them in the face? And the taxi driver said, I'm pretty sure that they would beat you up taxi driver said, what would happen if I went to that policeman on the corner over there and slapped him in the face? The taxi driver said, I know for sure he would beat you up, and then he would put you in jail. And then the guy says to the taxi driver, what would happen if I went up to your king and I slapped your king in the face? The guy could hardly comprehend it, and he said, you would be a dead man. And here's the point of that. The penalty for sin is not determined by our measure of it. In other words, it doesn't matter how low or serious we think the sin is. It doesn't matter whether we think we sin a little or whether we think we sin a lot. The penalty for sin is determined by the magnitude of the one that we sin against. So sinning against another person is completely different from sinning against the creator of the universe, completely different. Slapping the taxi driver or an acquaintance, slapping the random person, slapping the king, the severity of sin's punishment is always a reflection of the position of the one that you are sinning against. So, so how about you? Are you underestimating the severity of your sin? Because if you're underestimating it, you're just not going to be able to grasp the magnitude of being adopted by God into his family or grasp the idea that he's come so you can resemble him now and not the person that you used to be in the old life or the own nature. And, and so when we begin our new life with him and he imparted his Holy Spirit in us, it's so that he could transfer, transform us from the inside out so that we would start looking more like him. Uh, one of the things I like to do from time to time is go online and um, read the latest Barna survey. Barna likes to um, survey Christian trends within the United States. So th these might be a couple years old, but here, here are some um, recent statistics from a Barna study. Four out of five Americans identify themselves as Christian still. I kind of find that hard to believe because here in the Silicon Valley, it's probably less than 5% of, of anybody goes to any type of religious service, whether it's Christian, 
Hindu, Jew, Muslim. So, but taking the entire country, four out of five people would still identify themselves as a Christian. But of those four or five Americans, half of them are not involved in church on a weekly basis. Half actually believe the Bible is true. The majority don't have a biblical view of the world around them. And although 50% of Americans claim to be born again, meaning that they have a personal relationship with Christ, um, the Barna Group has found that their beliefs and their lifestyles are virtually not different from the rest of the world around them. In other words, many of them believe that they can earn their place to heaven. Many of these professing Christians believe that Jews and Muslims worship the same God. Some believe that Jesus sinned while he was here on earth. Um, many describe themselves as marginally committed to Christian. I'm not to Jesus. I'm not sure. How